it all started with a stress cough. Tell me about that. Absolutely. Um, a stress cough is the reason why I moved from Minnesota to Raleigh. In fact, you can look at it like that. It's not that linear, but that is essentially what happened uh, in my pursuit of getting healthy and well. Um, I made tons of life choices that ended up in a, a, a move across country. Wow. That, that I, I'm excited to talk about life transitions, and that's our topic today. And Dana, would you begin with just an introduction to let them know about our wonderful guest. I would be delighted to. Alice Pryor is a values-driven business relationship and client experience executive. And with a background in economics, she thrives in dynamic creative environments as a strategic partner, producing maximum value for each organization she works for. Raised in St. Paul, Minnesota, and following a challenging divorce family, uh, family situation as a child, she married at 20 and was a stay-at-home mom for 10 years, raising her two daughters. She later entered the workforce and managed to double her income in just 10 years from the start. She went on to be a successful executive that she is today, and ex but she also experienced divorce and job transitions herself along that path. She has cared for her mother and aunt, providing unwavering support until their passing, converted to Judaism, a decision that deepened her sense of identity and purpose. In 2023, she uprooted her life in Minnesota and relocated Raleigh, a move driven by her desire to be close to family while embarking on a new chapter. Embracing her Southern family roots, she is creating a fresh community here, building a new career and fostering new friendships. Her love for writing, has ignited an exciting journey with projects including not just a book, but also a movie idea. She's also exploring the potential of technology through a consulting opportunity in AI, co-founder of a nonprofit organization called Ava's Pathways, dedicated to supporting women in crisis and empowering them to rise above adversity. And finally, she is very passionate about pets. Now, with a philosophy of embracing life's challenges, transitions and taking on them on fearlessly. Alice looks forward to sharing her insights with us today of her own transformations. Her life journey is an inspiring testament to the power of change, resilience, and the pursuit of one's passions. It sounds like the American, is it the, uh, the uh, independence? That's it's good. It sounds good. I'm excited to talk about passions. It sounds great. <laughs> Welcome, Alice. Welcome. Good to have Thank you here. Thank you. Looking forward to hearing about your journey uh, and and really talking about handling different transitions and changes in life because you know stress can come from good changes and stress can mm -hmm. come from bad changes, and we have to realize all of them affect us. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, positive stress to me is as stressful as a negative stress. So when things are going well, it doesn't alleviate that feeling that um, something's going to go wrong or that there's massive change occurring and I'm getting used to new things. Talk about your journey to come here because you're new to the Triangle area and it's exciting to have you here. So I made a decision and it seemed really fast. Right. Um, when I moved from Atlanta to back home to Minnesota with my kids, and at the time they were in eighth and in 10th grade, respectively, I told my kids when Aunt Betty dies, we're all leaving. Like, that's it. Like this, this may have been where, where I was raised, but this is not going to be where I die. Right. We were leaving. Well, anyways, it took quite a few years, you know, life goes on and you think, you know, we give up on that dream, but no, Aunt Betty died January 13th and the 31st of January, that same month, I had a contract on a new construction home here in Raleigh. So um, my cousin was in disbelief. My children were um, not ready for it. I'm like, you should come with me. And they're like, no. <laughs> Um, but there have been a lot of positive changes there. And um, with that, just a thousand, like, um, you know, that they say that uh, phrase, death by paper cuts, right? You know, it's that decision fatigue of making all of those decisions at one time. Yeah, that that's a lot of change all at once. And yeah. uh, 
and w welcome to the whole area because I, I I was born and raised in D.C. and I just love Raleigh. I came down after going to college in North Carolina and moved here with my best friend. And obviously that was, let's see, that was in 83. So, you know, I think I like the place and there's a lot that is to offer. Alice, tell us a little bit, if you would, um, to the point you're comfortable about opening up some to some of the personal and professional challenges you've faced. And, uh, and then also you, you said something interesting. I know you've had some real negative challenges, but you also said that some of the positive challenges have been um, inter as stressful. But oh, tell us about some of these challenges. You know, in my adult life, I think, you know, um, in my divorce, that's when I started crafting a life for me but it really wasn't for me. It was crafting a life where I was servicing all my responsibilities. And um, doesn't matter how successful I was, I wasn't fulfilled. This move here to Raleigh is about me fulfilling my own cup, right? And um, so a lot of the challenges were that um, I didn't have a regular divorce. It was public and um, it, it wasn't that it was humiliating. It was that um, my ex had, uh, how do I put it? He got into the news media cycle separate from me and it was very negative. And so to walk through that with the shame that that created around me, you know, the guilt by association and it drove me to have a very private life for many, many years. And um, that's devastating to your psyche and to your identity because you shrink back. And in a time where I need to create a career and a good example for my children, I have this extreme sense of shame because I'm coming out of this relationship and I have the yuck all over me. And um, I think that has been one of my bigger challenges to really stepping out in my own identity is that I didn't feel like I could walk away from that and say that had nothing to do with me. It did because I was there. Right. And so I felt a lot of guilt, shame and accountability that I put on myself. I don't think other people did. But um, I felt very unrelatable because I couldn't tell my story without that. And, um, you know, so I think of everything, that would be the most notable thing. Now, I believe you were able to shelter your children from some of this news. And uh, if I recall from our prior conversation, but how old were your girls when this all erupted with your uh, spouse or ex-spouse now? Um, nine and 10 and it took a year and a half to get divorced and, um, he paid child support for six months and then skipped the country. So now you're, you're generating everything <laughs> and not yep. expecting to, that's a big deal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things because that, that you learned, because this is not a, I mean, this pe people, many people have had an experience like this to some degree, not this extreme, but sometimes when you go through the extremes, you're able to help people that have gone through less extremes even more. I'd love to hear your advice, your input, what you, some lessons you learned that could help other people on this, on a, hopefully a lighter version of. <laughs> you know, I was really lucky that I had um, a mentor come into my life and uh, really give me great advice. You know, the first thing was that I had to get out of my suburban housewife bubble in order to make this transformation. So if you can imagine, um, it wasn't overnight, but, um, you know, over the course of a year, I had this, you know, consistent messaging that you can't do this, you can't do that, which sounds very oppressive, but I was not preparing myself as a stay at home mom to be out in the workforce. And I suddenly had to do that and, um, to stay in a marriage an extra year when you know, some critical, awful things could happen is really stressful. And, um, I know, I know I'm not the only person who stays in order to get their ducks in a row. Um, 
but that's what I did. And um, there was a couple of things that, that my mentor told me. One of them is other people don't care about you. And I know that doesn't sound positive, but it really meant your destiny is up to you. Other people aren't sitting at the sidelines cheering you on like you, you know, like you would expect parents at their children's soccer game, for example. You really are driving your own ship and nobody cares more about your success than you, right? I've gotten great help along the way, but I've had to make things happen for myself. And that kind of resiliency that was built during that time period has served me so well. And um, understanding what that means is foundational to just getting up and once one foot in front of another. Yeah, that's great advice. I'm thinking even in when I'm teaching marketing for small business and they're worried about putting their little first video up, I go, no one cares. They really don't care. Just like that, that person you're losing sleep over is probably not losing sleep over you or thinking about you. So I really get the deeper wisdom in it. And one thing that came to mind is how did you choose the mentor? Because that's a big deal. You know, that's a, the, uh, there are safety issues. You have to think through any wisdom you have on selecting a mentor because mentors in entrepreneurship are important and life are important, all aspects. And you have to have some discernment. And what, what sure. advice do you have around that? Um, honestly, it's going to be a gut instinct. I, I wish I could tell you a formula, um, but it's going to be a gut instinct. Um, in the case of during my divorce, that person came into my life and that was the person who told me the truth the first time, right? And helped me um, rebuild my life, right? And so, um, you know, in that case, hearing the truth was the thing I needed. Fast forward in my career um, as a business relationship manager, I wasn't getting to where I needed to be. And um, as with any professional uh, association with certification, there's webinars and I'd gone to several and I picked a person that I felt comfortable with reaching out and he became my mentor. And it was one of those things is that ideally I wanted a woman and that just wasn't presenting itself to me. Um, but I have found the perfect person and, you know, that was a little bit of just div divine intervention that I just felt like through through the Zoom or the webinar, um, I, I think I can feel comfortable with this person. They, the way they ran the webinar, their um, confidence, you know, wasn't off-putting. And I felt like I could be vulnerable and honest with them. And uh, that's that was what worked for me. Uh, that's really important because there are several aspects to that is uh, I think one of the things you said that's valuable is sometimes when someone gives you advice that might piss you off a little or make you upset, but you know is true, could be a sign they might be a good person to work with. Versus someone who just automatically makes you feel good. I mean, you don't want someone who's just vicious or mean. There's a difference. Mm -hmm. But I think that's one of the signs is in, in a good mentor is, of course, they'll be supportive. But more important, they'll give you what you need to know so you can move forward. And I think that's one of the uh, components that your mentor gave you is the fact, you know, they don't care about you. You're going to have to generate that. And then the wonderful thing about that statement is then when people do, it's a bonus. You know, it's like, you know, sort of like if you pretend the world's full of narcissists and then people show up as really decent, you you might be happier instead of thinking they're all wonderfully thinking about you. So mm -hmm. I think there's some real wisdom in it. So this also uh, colored and influenced uh, the areas you got into. So I'd love to talk about that because it's, it's infused into your passion, your direction in your career and everything else. Yeah. Um, working with my mentor, I picked up um, a hugely valuable skill set. And uh, when I'm asked in interviews, uh, what was one of the most difficult workplaces or situations in a workplace 
And um, I always answer with this story. Uh, my mentor was an entrepreneur and he picked up and I thought I was going to work on movie sets and all this stuff, but that's his main book of business. No, no, no. I got all the, the little side projects and he would grab an idea, work with somebody, do the marketing, branding, you know, he would create what would be the marketing thrust of this. And then when he's looking at the execution and he would hit a snag, he'd drop it. I can't tell you how many things I worked on. And um, it was frustrating because at first I'm like, but we have all these, can't we fix it, right? And what I learned is to divest my, my uh, feeling of accomplishment from the task. And going through business, when somebody says, nope, we're cutting this off, we're moving forward, I pivot so fast because of this training, essentially. It, it was really um, grooming me to be um, adaptable and, and really looking forward to what will be successful and not being attached to people, products, projects, and really looking at being results oriented. So when other people try and, you know, like hammer a square peg in a round hole, I look at it and I'm like, well, that's not working. What other tools do we have, right? Because I'm looking for the outcome instead of getting invested in the process. And um, in business that has helped me immeasurably, but it was really born out of this horrible situation where, I had to drop everything I did. I would do research on internet pricing and then he's like, nope, we're not doing the online magazine. You know, I'd have to do research on something else and nope, we're not doing this, right? And, you know, to watch that creative process, uh, when I got my PMP, my project management professional certification, when I took the test, you can see the project initiation, very strong. Project, you know, closure, really weak because I wasn't allowed to close anything. You know, we just wrapped it up, started running with things, and then if it didn't work, dropped it. Well, that's really so important in so many, you know, from a business standpoint, a work standpoint that people don't often think about. And I think it is hard to be invested in something, do all that work, like you say, the research, the planning, the pre-planning, the this and that for maybe weeks and months, and then all of a sudden it gets pulled. And mm -hmm. so you, you've you learned to pivot without um, without really a heart, big heartache and kind of move on to right. what is going to uh, produce dividends, right, based upon new directions. Yeah, my ego is separated from that, and it was super helpful to learn that lesson. How did you manage your career, your upward, rapidly growing upward career with being a single mom with two, two young daughters? Um, honestly, um, when I moved back home to Minnesota, I became an admin at U.S. Bank, and um, I was overqualified for the job. But I took it because I would have stable hours and good benefits and all the things that you look for as a parent. And um, I remember going to the interview, and the interviewer um, – told me I was overqualified. I did not even write a thank you letter, like, which is so against, you know, how I, I, I do things. And because I'm like, she's never going to hire me, you know, like, and she did. And I stayed there a little bit too long. I had um, gotten my PMP certification and then realized that um, in project management, it is normal that when projects kind of expand that you do overtime, it, you know, just by design it, it happens. And then there'll be other times there's not a lot of work. And I waited until the kids were much older and that's when my income growth started happening, right? You know, is that when the kids got close to being out of the house, that was it. I really put a focus on my own career, but, um, to say that I didn't have enough money for everything was true. The project management is a huge task to take on. Why did you choose that? Because that is uh, not an easy program. Not an easy program. And I was involved with the program of creating, seeing if we could create sales as a profession. And we use project management as one of the newest professional associations that came into existence in the last 50 mm -hmm. years. 
And there's a lot of pillars and hoops you have to go through to get that. Well, I mean, if you think about it, I was wholly responsible for everything in my life. So I was running projects all the time, right? So um, it was up to me to get good results. And uh, it was natural, right? In order to control my life, I had to become, it's not that I had to become controlling, I had to become accountable and responsible, right? And, um, you know, finding solutions. Finding solutions for other people comes easy to me in the sense that I'm passionate about helping other people, you know, make their lives successful or get their business going. It's probably part of the reason why I can get other people hired and I don't do it for myself, right? You know, um, I that old saying, you know, if you can't do teach, I'm one of those. That's such an important point. Most of most people are like that, though. You know, it's I can help market someone else, but I can't market myself. When I work with top salespeople job hunting, I go, you know, you're a top salesman in closing. And they'll say, now I need you to pretend it's not you. How would you market a person like you? And it's funny how sometimes that simple statement mm -hmm. will get them to work out exactly what they need to do to get their next job. So this is a very clear human condition that occurs. I was just smiling because I was thinking, you know, two teenage girls probably really demands a lot of creative negotiating, project management <laughs> for survival and, and all the aspects that a project, because, yeah, a lot of times a project manager doesn't have all the authority they need to motivate people. So they've got to be very creative in getting things done. Yeah, totally true. And um, as far as parenting is concerned, I tell everybody that, um, you know, uh, Stephen Covey's seven habits of highly successful people. Well, one of those habits, I forget what number is, uh, work with what's working, right? Um, I have found that if you lean into strengths or what's working, bad habits or bad behaviors just fall away due to lack of use. Right. So um, that that helps so much because I took myself out of battling and then leaned into what was working. So my kids are very different. That worked really well for my youngest and my eldest. You know, she was just going to move along at her own pace. Right. I had to put structure and rigid, you know, rules about uh, things with her, like homework assignments, you know, big papers, you know, get her on a schedule, which she resented entirely. And fast forward to my move, she did the exact same thing back to me with the move, like putting me on a schedule and talking to me like this was like her high school paper. I was so proud because all of that work manifested with her giving me the same advice back. So I couldn't be more pleased. You know, that's such an important point. Have you ever heard of the book Strength Finders? That's another one where yes. basically they studied, it was life changing for me in IBM because when I was in IBM, the, the evaluation was all on find out what you're weak on and work on it. <laughs> so I didn't have a lot of confidence. So of course, all these evaluations brought up my weak points. And I read this book and it says successful people don't do that. They do what they're best at, make enough money to pay someone else to do it. And, and it's hard to explain, but this was back in like 95. I'm going, wow, that's completely different than the, the way IBM, at least my interpretation of the valuation system was, you know, well, you're, you're not good at making eggs. So now you need to make more eggs. <laughs> no, let me do what I'm best at. And uh, so I think that's, that's really important also in project management that you're looking, okay, this person really is best at this. How do we utilize them and what they're best at? And I, I think that uh, training you got there could really be helpful in being effective because project management it looks to me a lot like herding cats more than anything else, except for the fact you don't have the authority to, I don't know, use a stun gun on the cats. I don't, you know what I mean? It's like, you know, you, you, you know, you can't. And so you really have to get them interested in the direction, motivated, creating accountability through whatever tools you have. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and you also have to build people's confidence that they can be successful, right? Um, and you know, it's it's interesting when you when you sit down with people in project management, you find out what's important to them, you know, how risk averse they are in or, you know, if it's time really important or is quality really important? Would you rather, you know, if we needed to take twice as much time, get it done right? Or do we need to go with speed and then just plan for the cleanup later, right? And, um, you know, really understanding other people before you take action is what makes a person successful. It's true in project management, in parenting, even with your friendships, right? is really understanding what's important to the other person because then you are adjusting how you behave to get the best results. Yeah, I love that. You um, described, we'll go back a little bit if you don't mind, you described mm-hmm. taking a job with uh, an admin with uh, with a bank, I think you said, oh. um, and that job was, was not requiring the skills, the knowledge that you have, nor did it pay what you had hoped, but it was a bridge job that provided what you needed in terms of flexibility to raise the girls and, and earn something. You know, a lot of people that I work with, are their egos or whatever, you, whatever might be preventing them uh, kind of get in the way of that attitude if they really kind of need to take a bridge job, but they feel like it's beneath them. They've had some accomplishments, experience, made a lot of money and – uh, how? Why should I have to do that? How am I going to come to grips with it? How did you kind of handle that part? You know, mm. the part of of letting go of ego to accomplish something, uh, survive and thrive, whatever you want to call it. How did you do that? There was a couple of things. Uh, first of all, it was mastery of something I didn't know. So I had to actually do the work first. <laughs> And the other thing that happened is that over time, I found other ways to fill my need of being useful, right? I wasn't the admin that sat chained to the desk and only answered the phone and did a couple of PowerPoints, if that, right? Um, What I did is I became a valuable resource to the entire department, which at the time was about 170 people-ish. And I took on responsibilities were appropriate for my role. Now, that long term didn't make me popular with my boss, who preferred the grumpy admin who only answered the phone, who was the gatekeeper of her and her time. Right. And um, so, I mean, it was time to move on after three and a half years. But what I did is. I forged really, really strong relationships and I found what needs were being not met in the department. And I found a way to do all of it and the job that was, you know, not really mentally stimulating for me. So really you, you, uh, you, you took a political risk by doing Mm -hmm. more than what the job description required, more than what the boss really wanted. But it paid dividends for you. That risk paid dividends. It may have hurt some feelings, the boss's feelings. She didn't fire you, but she just yeah. wasn't she wasn't comfortable with your doing more, you know, more than what's asked for, which isn't surprising in a, mm-hmm. you know some companies. Mm-hmm. Uh, the CEOs don't like to hear that because they want well, they want to think everybody's you know doing more than they uh, are asked to do, right? Mm-hmm. But uh, that's a really uh, interesting. A story and and did that pay dividends? Did you find that attitude paid dividends for you later in your career? Yes, um, I think the first thing is the value of building relationships. So in my case, I was brought into an office, and the person I was replacing was in a different city, and she was not going to be the one training me. So my boss had to find somebody else in the building to train me. And, um, and then literally the next day, my boss went on, on a work trip. So no support. I had to literally figure it out on my own. And what I realized is that this network of other admins, we really propped each other up and somebody would get it good at one skill and then, you know, be a resource for other people, either to help them learn or to do a little one-off favor, you know, just because it was not a big ask. And um, I have found that in my project management career, 
that networking and relationship building is so important because I was able to do things that other people couldn't do, not because I'm smarter, not because I'm working harder, but because I had people that I've been filling their cup who were willing to fill my cup back when I asked, right? And um, so it was the networking of knowing if I ask enough people, I'll, fi I'll figure it out, right? And oftentimes people stop short of what's needed because um, they think, well, it's not in my job description. I don't know it. I don't have the power or authority and they stop. And then things just get kicked down to somebody else with either more power of authority or it gets to be an escalation when it never needed to be. So going back still a little bit here, because this is fascinating and people are interested in the how. How do I overcome some of these challenges like you have? And uh, But, <clears throat> you know, you went from raising the girls to, you know, in that bridge job to starting when the girls started to get older, then you were able to do more of the um, and, and ultimately become an executive. Um, but somewhere in between there, you took care of your aging mom and your aunt, aging aunt. How mm. did you fit all that in? Um, the answer is, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I think you get into a routine and when you have a routine, you know how to slice off other pieces of time. Right. And, um, I think that's what really saved me. I don't necessarily have a structured routine about everything, but I do know how much time it takes me to do most things. And, um, you know, and then at a certain point, you have to say, this is more important than the other thing. And at that point, that's when there's no more time to carve out. You have to let other things go that are not as important. And uh, that was what I had to do. And um, I did, I did burn myself out a little bit. Um, you know, I didn't take time off when my father died. I barely took time off when my mother died, uh, which was not a smart move. And um, then finally, when my Aunt Betty was um, terminally ill, I took seven weeks FMLA and it was the best decision of my life because that was the care that was needed. And I will never regret not getting those paychecks ever. That time with my aunt was more important than those paychecks. That's that's really valuable, and the 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 I want to back up with one or two things you talked about that's so important in dealing with stress and dealing with change is learning to start building your a network of people and find out who who you can support and who can and in some companies that network is outside the company. I mean, there was a time in IBM where. Uh, for me, the, the other people, most of the other people were so predatory and competitive. Uh, it, it would have been wiser to have the network outside than inside. So I want to talk about in dealing with stress, you, you really want to build that team. And then also finding out what is your version of uh, a breather, a break, uh, what gets you away? I mean, some people might be building a shed in the backyard. You know, another might be going on a trip to a new location and really noticing when, okay, I'm, I'm, I've reached the threshold. In, in mine, helping out with my wife, we, you know, I go for a bicycle ride and I can go out and get a little ride in a break. And, and I invested in an electric bike and I thought, wow, this is extravagant. I remember my doctor said it's cheaper than a heart attack because with that little extra push, I can get a much greater distance in less time and not be away from her for helping her. You know, getting that little extra break really makes a difference. So I think it's important in transition, know that stress can happen with good things and bad things. And what do you need as a break to be able to get back on the horse and be productive? Mm -hmm. And uh, and also this happens when uh, we see people moving from day jobs where the, the company creates all the structure to being self-employed. You know, they they go, no, you had structure there. You have to now synthesize it for yourself. Yep. Um, first of all, for me, I'm an extrovert and getting out and being with people is important. So with my move here to Raleigh specifically, I have prioritized um, spending time with my cousin and her friend network 
in doing networking. Um, and that's because this is intended to be a permanent move. This is not a casual thing. I've, this is where I've intended to be my home base. So it's up to me to find my own friendships. So um, I don't ever want to feel isolated or alone. And when you move, you can do that really easily, right? And so I've prioritized that even actually over getting a job because having that community is everything you can have a job and be miserable you know and so that's been a huge priority you know i do other things like exercise um you know i've historically you know done reiki gotten massages you know all that other personal care um you know it's just i kind of try and listen to myself but the biggest thing for me is finding a community and making that happen because it's not just like one religious organization will fulfill all of your needs, right? It, you're going to need different people in your life to service different needs. And um, I'm in a new city and I have the, the great gift of discovery, right? You know, in the, in the city that you live in, you don't go to the museums all the time, but when you travel somewhere, you do. And I I love that about being in a new city and Raleigh has so much to offer. Um, you know, there's something going on all the time. And uh, that's been hugely important for me because the isolation is something that um, I avoid, right? Because that's how I get into those dark spaces. And other people need that isolation. I'm, I'm an extrovert and I, I learned very on my life when I was single, my life was better when I had, a housemate, not that I had to relate to him, just someone else in the house. I went, okay, let's work with it. And then I think there's a point in life where you, you, there's a point in life when you're younger, you go, well, I should be able to. And then there's a point in the life is I have not succeeded at this yet. I need to just accept that and move things around so they work for me. And I think that's really uh, what you're talking about is learning to do it. It reminds me of a very smart business man that had a PC business. And I said, uh, why do you never answer the phone? And he said, because I'll give away the business. He says, I'm just that person. I need somebody as a gatekeeper. And I thought at the time, I thought, well, you know, you should be able to do it. I went, wait, how am I shooting myself? And then. Uh, after that, I got a assistant that at the time looked like I couldn't afford it. And her job is to keep me from giving away the store. You know, I'll, I'll do a, a, a charity work for maybe a veteran or something. And she'll go, you've used up your charity this month. And that's part of her job. So it's putting those things in place that make you effective instead of just going, I ought to be able to do this and dragging that same failure along over and over. And that's what I hear you've done. Yeah. I, you know, um, other people say, you know, I am a $50 an hour person and I don't do $10 an hour tasks. Uh, that also applies. Alice, before we move to some of the wonderful things you're working on and your ambitions, Mm -hmm. Are there any other personal or professional challenges that you want to just highlight that hit you hard that you also had to overcome? Yeah. Um, in the workplace, I've had quite a few um, situations where, you know, um, I've been set up to fail. And, you know, I, I know I'm not unique in that, but uh, it over several jobs, I've had different opportunities to handle the, the, the same kind of roadblocks, right? They, they weren't the same people, but they were the same kind of roadblocks and really work on myself professionally where I focused more on how I need to show up and what my intention is in the situation instead of the injustice that was in front of me, right? It was still unjust. I still, you know, complain to my best girlfriend about those things. But in the moment when I show up to work, conscientiously taking that chip off my shoulder, putting it on the desk, right? So I can shine through, do what I need to do and not have that affect um, the business or how I show up. And um, in certain situations, that was quite difficult. Well, that's really fascinating because 
you know, I think a lot of us have those times when we are carrying that chip and we're angry or we feel there's something going totally wrong. And we, you know, you tell a couple people about it in the workplace and some people don't want to hear that, right? For one thing, even your boss, if it's a problem, sometimes they, that boss doesn't want to hear about it. And I think what you're saying is that you have to kind of use your intuition on that and decide what, you know, pick your battles, right? Is kind of what you're saying in a, in, in a nutshell. And also to, to let go of some things that may actually be most important in your head, but may not be most important for getting uh, getting yourself ahead, you know, or moving ahead or solving the problem. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, yes. And one more thing, which is not losing sight of who you are, right? And that is when, when people poke the bear, right? They challenge you to become a different person, right? Because they want that negative engagement. And it is the actual challenge, which is to stand in your integrity with who you are, whatever that means for you, right? Is to not change who you are because somebody else is doing something you do not like. Um, you know, I, I learned that with my mother, right? She was not an easy person to take care of as she was aging because she was so fiercely independent. And I had to remember no matter what she hurled at me, I'm standing here in my responsibility because I choose to be here lovingly and do this work, whether you're grateful for it or not, right? And I will continue showing up and I can adjust how I show up to you to have better results, but I'm not gonna change who I am as a person or the integrity that I stand for. And that is a huge challenge in every place in your life, but especially when people try and have negative engagement and drag you into the mud. You know, I view this as what I call living from commitment <laughs> and the freedom that gives you that I believe very few people have experienced because they've never really, it's sort of a, it, the, the feeling I have in it is surrendering to what I say I'm committed to. And, mm -hmm. and when you agree, when you did that with your mother, it almost gave you a weird feeling of freedom. It's hard to describe unless you've experienced it. And so many people get caught in the, I'm offended and upset. Those all are there. It's just, what are you committed to in this scene? And mm -hmm. that really does, gives a clarity and a, a freedom that's, I think, sadly, few people have experienced in life. And I'm so blessed. I learned that and experienced it because I'm personally a very emotional person and it usually was was a roller coaster inside for me and learning wait a second the 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 uh the plan the commitment the direction <clears throat> gives me a freedom that I don't get from the bubbling emotional from time to time. Mm -hmm. So Alice um Tell us, uh, looking forward, everything you've been through, and you, you just seem to make um, my grandmother, who lived to be 100, she used to say, make, make lemonade out of lemons, and I think that's what you do. But tell us about your, you know, a little bit of detail about your book idea, your movie mm. idea, your nonprofit and, uh, and and also you mentioned that work-wise, you're really fascinated I guess it's the talk of the town, but AI, mm -hmm. what aspect of AI most intrigues you? Um, we'll start with AI and try and work backwards. Um, with AI, um, this is what intrigues me. I do not believe that I'm the smartest person in the room. But what I do believe is that um, I do English to English translation, which means I'm like, I do marketing and branding naturally, right? I can, you know, getting to what messaging is important and what is effective. And when I have used AI, it's really in using the tool to craft the story, right? And what I find with people who um, are good at execution, but not good at telling the story, is that if I ask careful questions, I can populate like with bullet points, some of the points that you wanna convey. And then without being an English major, like spit out exactly what you want because it's a collective whole of 
how to write a business plan or how to write uh, an employment letter, you know, just really diving into what's important to me and how can all of those gaps be filled in, right? That to me is how I'm using it. Obviously, AI usage is infinite, right? And um, just the education around it, the awareness of how it's going to transform the workplace. You know, um, I'd love to say in the next 10 years, but I think every six months we're going to find that, you know, things are going to turn over in a way that many people wouldn't have expected, right? You know, as it grows and evolves and people's creativity drive the direction that it goes in next. Could you give a, a specific example? Because that's really good. I hear where you're going. And, uh, yeah. you know, one of the tools you like using, ChatGBT or Bard or one of those. Mm -hmm. So what I'm finding is that, um, you know, in the social media that I consume, there's a lot of people showing you how you can use um, AI to create a business plan for you and create money on online, right? And um, at, first of all, you know, truth in advertising is probably not that easy and, and it takes a few more steps than that. And um, I think what's going to happen is that as people keep on throwing these things out right into the ether, some of those things are going to work right? Some of those things are going to work. And um, we're going to find that the things that we found challenging, some of those barriers are going to go away. You know, so um, we have a lot of people who are creating coursework for all sorts of things, resume writing, all the way through to probably code, right? So now, you know, people at home can start doing these things. So I think the education industry specifically is going to be kind of that first front as people figure out that people will buy training material that, you know, is created. And what I'm finding is in feedback is that training material sometimes can be dated in, in eight weeks because the AI has changed or there's system updates, et cetera. So it's going to be an iterative process where we're gonna to have to figure out how to handle this rapidly changing landscape where code and AI is rapidly advancing and we can't keep up with the training and education. Well, it's interesting you say that because Martin and I do a course on AI and mm -hmm. and we we chuckle because we'll call each other a, every single day what's yeah. new today. Yeah. And there is something new. And I think part of it is we're seeing it proliferate in every aspect of business. It was mm -hmm. basically dormant for from like 2018 until 2022 or so. And now it's come alive and I I think it's because of cross-pollination meaning I see AI being used in the finance department, and I'm in marketing, and I say, hey, I could use that part of it, and then uh, then manufacturing or whatever. I mean, every business function is kind of, you know, picking up on what the other function is doing, I believe, and that's in part why it's why it's growing so so fast. What about your uh, what about your nonprofit, real quick, and then let's finish up with your book idea and, and your, movie. your movie. Yeah, whatever you're willing to share publicly yeah. this time. Yeah. So um, as far as the nonprofit, um, you know, my my uh, colleague that I'm, I'm doing this this venture with, she called me up one day and she's like, do you want to be on my board? I'm like, yes, she didn't even finish. Right. Um, it's important for me to give back. Right. I've been very blessed to have people support me through my horrific journey. And when she told me she wanted to help forgotten women, you know, those are the women that uh, people have just kind of written off. They've gone through lots of trauma or uh, whatever their situation is, and they're isolated. Well, in in the creation of the business plan, and that's a stage we're in now, um, the clarification of what that looks like when you've been isolated, like how I've I felt in that moment, and then having to rebuild and really understanding the messaging that needs to happen. You know, we started working with the advisor to try and, you know, make the wording palatable. And I stopped it and I said, you know what? You have to put the word trauma in there, right? Because I wouldn't go and see a therapist in Minnesota because I didn't feel like she could relate to the kind of trauma I had. And I had um, an association with somebody in the UK and paid thousands of dollars more 
outside my insurance because I knew somebody could relate to the story and the trauma that I had. And that is so important when you're reaching people is that they are seen for what they are. And that includes the trauma and they are held in respect. So tell us about the book and the movie. Okay. So because I have such an unusual story, right? Some of the hardship that I've gone through, uh, the disastrous divorce, you know, I tell people all the time um, that I've never lost. I have the worst divorce story ever, right? And it's not something you should be proud of. And yet it is something that is true for me. And I will have women go, oh, my husband cheated. And <laughs> I'm like, I wish he stopped at that. <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be amazing. <laughs> right, right. I'm like having a, a regular disappointing husband would have been an upgrade for me, Right. And so for me in sitting down and writing the book, I have to walk through a lot of pain and really focus on the messaging regarding um, the resilience and what moving forward looks like and what helped me. And those are not easy things to tap because uh, much of what I walked through, I did in survivor mode, right? It's that I had no choice other than to move forward because I couldn't, couldn't bear standing still or moving backwards, right? Those were both unacceptable outcomes for me. And um, some, sometimes people say, how did you do that? I'm like, sometimes I, I don't know, right? You know, I, I come from strong stock, that's true. But, um, you know, in the last few months, I've gotten very clear on the thing that, that helped me the most is really understanding who I was, right? There's a lot of books about finding your why and what's your passion, but really defining myself. We spend our entire childhood with people telling us if we're good or bad or smart or pretty, you know, and you have to stop and say, no, I define myself. This is my choice about who I, I am and how I show up in the world. And that's what's helped me move forward. It's because I defined the source and the well of, of all the emotion and power that I have. I define that to move forward. And I didn't rely on other people's reflection of me or their feedback because sometimes feedback's wrong, right? It might be true for you, the feedback giver, but it doesn't represent who I am because you're not seeing who I am. That may be because I'm not showing up how I want to, but it may be because you have a lens that you have a bias and you need to figure out which is, which is true. You know, the, the, the concept of using writing, uh, not just to produce something, but almost your own therapy. I remember a veteran telling me one time he wrote his story of being in Vietnam because he really was going to leave this for his kids. And then he planned on checking out, you know, or possibly, or, you know, one sure he'd survive. And the process of writing the story was his therapy that he didn't expect. So I think this has multi, mm -hmm. multiple payoffs you're talking about, not just writing that, and but also going towards what if we could create this as a book and a movie, even if it happens or not, it's clearly giving you value right now. And I think yeah. that's a wonderful thing with change is finding P your version of that. What lets you to complete that past? Because we can't change what happened, but we can shift our relationship to it. And that's such an important aspect of dealing with change. And especially people who've had horrific childhoods and others, you know, mm -hmm. you're not going to change what happened, but you can change your interpretation of it. I think that's really yep. an important message. Yep, absolutely. And my movie has nothing to do with my with my life story, I should say. Um, after my kids left the house, I lived in an apartment and it is like I was watching a movie, watching all these 30 year olds run around and date and do all the things. And um, I have an outline of the movie and I found out that it is hard to write dialogue. 
right? Um, but it's all sitting there. And when I talk to my girlfriend um, and her mother, she's Asian and her mother gets on her about not being married. You know, um, she's just barely 30, but you know, the, the pressure is real. And I'm like, well, but you marry Rob in the movie. Isn't that good enough for your mom? <laughs> you know, so this movie is like in my head, it's already done, right? So I am looking forward to the the fun and joy that that is, right? It, because it's just kind of an ex extrapolation of my actual life, watching these people around me and really truly enjoying the scenarios that life is, right? You know, and who doesn't like a self-indulgent rom-com? <laughs> yeah, that sounds great. Well, this was just terrific to chat with you and our journey on this. And uh, I want to add her LinkedIn profile. We'll add it below, too, because you've really done a great job with that, kind of showing your professional qualifications and skills. And uh, clearly, you're, you know, whatever you set your mind to, you're going to get profound results. And in my short knowing of you in this interview and look forward to hearing about the further progress you make, especially with the book, the story and everything else. Mm -hmm. And again, welcome to our wonderful uh, Raleigh area. I love it. I've been here since I think 82 and it's a great place to live. Well, is LinkedIn the best way for people to reach out to you, um, Alice? Um, it, it's a great way of reaching out. Um, I'm lucky that my email is my first name dot last name at gmail.com. So that's uh, probably, but that they both email me. So that's email, great. LinkedIn, and we also know you're, you're open to finding a new work opportunity. So mm -hmm. if somebody's listening to the broadcast might like to talk to you about a uh, job opportunity, you're open to that amongst everything else you're doing. We know as a PMP, <laughs> it's no problem managing uh, all these projects at once, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, not a problem whatsoever. They go. If they want to get the project done and they need a <laughs> call Alice, a, a cat herder <laughs> that's very skilled and trained, I think you, you would be qualified that's wonderful well, excellent thank you, thank you excellent thank you thank you so much <laughs>